The crisis in theological education is not over there. It's always here, wherever you are. Welcome. I'm uh, Sujin Pak, Dean of the School of Theology at Boston University, and it's my delight to welcome you to this event this evening. We are here for the, uh, the, the Fall Lowell Lectures, and I want to begin by recognizing the generous support of the Lowell Institute. The Lowell Lectures have become a grand tradition at the School of Theology, and they're made possible by the visionary support and the generosity of the Lowell Institute. And so I offer my profound thanks to them for partnering with the School of Theology for many years to support learning, awareness, and conversation. I also want to express my gr gratitude to Andrew Kimball. Where are you, Andrew? Yes. <clears throat> for your leadership, Andrew, for your facilitation of this event. You are a, a great gift to this community. We're blessed by your grace and goodness and all that you bring to the things you lead and, and do. Thank you. The Lowell Lectures this year are focused on questions and issues for reimagining theological education for today. And such, as you may well know, is very desperately, perhaps desperately needed for today. Our guest speaker tonight, Associate Dean of Faculty, Dr. Ted Smith from Candler School of Theology, is a visionary and innovative leader in this work. And you'll hear more about that from the introduction for him. Thank you, Dean Smith, for joining us this evening for conversation and to share from your years of leadership and scholarship, particularly around this issue of thinking about theological education and reimagining and innovating within it. And lastly, it is my honor to introduce you to our moderator for this evening, Dean Brian Stone. Brian is Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and the E. Stanley Jones Professor of Evangelism at Boston University School of Theology. And he has served as co-director of the Center for Practical Theology, a gifted administrator and teacher who, with whom I'm deeply honored to be working and partnering. He has served as Associate Dean of Academic Affairs since January 2011 and E. Stanley Jones Professor of Evangelism at the School of Theology since 1998. He has a background in church development, urban pastor, pastoral ministry, and faith-based nonprofit development. Brian's most recent books are Evangelism After Pluralism, Finding Faith Today, and A Reader in Ecclesiology. And his research, publishing, and teaching are in the areas of evangelism, congregational development, ecclesiology, Christian pacifism, Wesleyan liberation, narrativ narrativist and post-liberal theologies, as well as the theology of popular culture. And so his current project is a study of horror films and how one might think theologically about those and the, the theological insights and questions these films might offer. Brian and his wife Cheryl live on campus at Boston University where they are faculty and residents. So Dean Stone will introduce our speaker and our panelists, so please join me in welcoming Dean Stone. Thank you, Dean Pock, and it's a pleasure to introduce our guests, uh, our guests and also our respondents. Uh, Reverend Dr. Ted Smith is the Charles Howard Candler Professor of Divinity and Associate Dean of Faculty at Emory University's Candler School of Theology. He also serves as Director of Theological Education Between the Times, which is a project that gathers diverse groups of people to think together about the meanings and purposes of theological education. With Dr. Joanne Solis Walker, he is co-principal investigator for Candler's Innovative Pathways for Tomorrow initiatives. Reverend Dr. Smith is the author of three books, The End of Theological Education, which is just recent, uh, Weird John Brown, 2015, and The New Measures in 2007. Together, these books try to think theologically about core American Protestant institutions, practices, values, and rhetoric in the time of their unraveling. Smith has also edited books on sexuality and ordination, contemporary issues in preaching, and economic inequality, along with a series of books on theological education. Uh, beyond Candler, 
Reverend Dr. Smith teaches in the Ethics and Practical Theology courses of study in Emory's PhD program in religion, and he has served as a senior fellow with the University of Virginia's pro project on religion and its publics. He has affiliated faculty with Emory, Emory Law School's Center for the Study of Law and Religion. He also serves on the editorial boards for Political Theology, Journal of the Society of Christian Ethics, and Interpretation, a journal of Bible and theology. He's also part of the cohort that was with Shelley Rambo when they were coming up, and he has stories about Shelley, so we might want to ask about those <laughs> sometime. But we're really glad you're here and looking forward to hearing from you. We'll introduce the respondents after you're done talking. Okay. Thank you, Dean Stone and uh, Professor Rambo, you can be assured. I, I remember nothing. <laughs> and I understand the concept of mutual assured destruction. <laughs> so you'll get no stories from me. Uh, thank you, Dean Stone, for that kind introduction. And I'm grateful to the Lowell Institute for funding this important lecture series. It's an honor to be a part of it. And I'm grateful to Dean Pak for inviting me to participate in it. Thank you. And thanks, I, I have to add my thanks to hers, to Andrew Kimball, uh, who's done so much to make me feel welcome here and just to make it possible for me to be here. And I'm grateful to friends old and new who are here tonight. Uh, it's, it's really great to get to see so many of you. Thanks for turning out. All right, every time that I try to describe the crisis in theological education in specific terms, every time I name names, I get in trouble. Because no one wants their school to be included in a list of signs of crisis. Now, for, for the record, I wasn't going to say anything about BU in my examples here, but you know, there's recording devices, there's social media. Again and again, I mention somebody's school. I'm not even in their time zone. They find me. They come back. So let me speak more generally and just say this. I know of no school today that is doing theological education as professional education in a sustainable way. I know of no school today that is doing theological education as professional education in a sustainable way. Some practices are obviously unsustainable. You can only sell your campus once. And this is especially true. It's visible uh, that it's unsustainable. Uh, when schools sell off these non-monetary endowments like land, buildings, libraries, air rights, still not naming names. Other practices are more subtle and pernicious. The ever-growing use of adjunct instructors, for instance, amounts to an unsustainable extraction from faculty lives. And when those lives become unsustainable because of the injustice of the practice, the practice will be unsustainable too. Just so the growing reliance on student debt amounts to an unsustainable extraction from students. It's like strip mining. You can't do it forever. Even if debt-funded tuition payments help a school keep its doors open in the short run, they threaten the whole ecology. For debt-ridden students tend to leave ministry sooner, in part to pay their bills. So the safest bet may seem to be making a prudent draw from an endowment. And that might seem infinitely sustainable. But that sustainability is the counterfeit immortality promised by fund managers. For schools that rely too much on endowments, like congregations that rely too much on, on endowments, are always at risk of folding in on themselves, losing connections to larger communities, and existing to serve the privileged few who are already inside their walls. We already see some well-endowed schools with more money than mission. So the crisis, none of these models are sustainable. And the crisis runs across the whole theological and political spectrum. In the last 20 years, schools identified as liberal and mainline, and schools identified as conservative, evangelical, or Pentecostal have all sold their campuses. Catholic seminaries across the country are struggling to fill their spaces. And schools of every kind are putting more money into recruiting and marketing 
and financial aid offers as we all compete to win a bigger slice of a shrinking pie of students who want to do professional education as theological education. So I'm gonna let you fill in all the names yourselves. Suffice to say, the crisis in theological education is not over there. It's always here, wherever you are. So tonight I wanna to think with you about the nature of that crisis and some handholds we might take hold of as we try to find a faithful way through. In particular, I wanna think with you about first how the current constellation came to be, which I'll call consolidation. And second, why this is breaking down, what I'd describe as an unraveling. And third, how some of the forces that are breaking it down can be turned to create next faithful models of theological education in the US, what I'll call affordances. So consolidation, unraveling, and affordances. First, consolidation, or how the current constellation came to be. It is worth remembering that we have been in a time like this before. In the end of theological education, I try to lay out three periods in the history of North American social imaginaries, and all the usual academic disclaimers apply. This typology relies on fuzzy boundaries. It was achieved only by lumping together things that should have been kept apart, and by splitting things that should have been kept together. So it is flawed and it is fallible. Its purpose is not to capture every fact, but to fail in interesting ways. So with that academic throat clearing performed, and you're welcome to lift that paragraph anytime you need to present a typology, it always works, or it doesn't work, but it is what it is. With that academic throat clearing uh, out of the way though, let me try to lift up three different eras defined by three different social imaginaries. First, Standing orders. Now these ran roughly from the first European settlements to the revolution. European immigrants brought with them post-Westphalian European imaginaries that featured some kind of established church linked closely to the sovereign political power. Now language of standing order comes from Connecticut, but the imaginary was shared widely. Here in New England, the established-ish church was the line of Puritanism that became Congregationalism. In Virginia, it was Episcopalians in the watershed of the James River. In New York, it was the Dutch Reformed churches up the Hudson. Visions of establishment were never fully realized anywhere in North America, but they were nonetheless extremely powerful, even in the minds of dissenting groups. So second, a second era in this typology is one I'll associate with voluntary associations. And this social imaginary centered on voluntary associations was the dominant uh, form from the early national period through the long 60s of the 20th century. This is the buzzing world of associations that Tocqueville saw. It's the world in which Newberry Bible Institute was founded and went on to become the Boston University School of Theology we know today. Voluntary associations spread through every sphere of society, but Christianity helped birth them and then bound itself especially tightly to this social imaginary. So all the legacy institutions that try to organize religion today, congregations, denominations, seminaries, and more, they're all stamped with this social imaginary of voluntary associations. And it's one reason that pollsters for almost a century have been able to take affiliation with a voluntary association as a pretty good proxy for religious belief and practice. To be religious just was to be affiliated with a voluntary association. So that's a second one. The third, authentic individuals. Seeds of this social imaginary were already present in the African diaspora already present among Puritans and their transcendentalist great-grandchildren, already present in all those touched by revival. But the social imaginary itself centered on in authentic individuals. It consolidated its power in the long 60s of the 20th century, and it shapes both affects and aspirations today. All right, I'm gonna say more about all of these, but I just wanna get them on the table. Standing orders, voluntary associations, and authentic individuals as kind of three different social imaginaries, a term I'm borrowing from Charles Taylor. Now you already, I'm sure, because I know your type, even if I don't know you, and I know many of you, 
you already have exceptions and counterpoints that you have thought of to this typology. I have some too, but I think even in its failing, it can help us see some important things. First, I think it resists the world historical story of secularization that dominated so much social theory in the 19th and 20th centuries. Instead of a single unitary process running from magic to religion to reason or whatever, this threefold story that I'm trying to tell suggests a, not movement in one direction or another, but a series of moments in which ideas and institutions came together with great power and then unraveled only for some holdovers to join with new elements to form a new constellation that even as it is being born, we know will pass away in time. Crucially, this is neither a story of progress nor decline. Not a story of progress nor decline. It is a story of the finitude of all human projects. This fallible typology can also help us see where we are in time. We are not at the end of some centuries-long process of secularization. We are rather in a time between the times. More specifically, we're in a time when a whole ecology of institutions formed in and for an age of voluntary associations, like this school, like my school, when that whole ecology formed in an old social imaginary doesn't fit with lives that are formed, for better and for worse, for authentic individualism. And this flawed and fallible typology can remind us that we have been here before. The last transition, the last big one, from standing orders to voluntary associations, it brought crisis too. The institutions did not fit with people's lives. At the time of the revolution, in 1776, by one good estimate, just 17% of Americans who had a choice, people who were not enslaved, were affiliated with some congregation. Take that in. In 1776, 83% of Americans were nuns. 83. Why? Weren't we settled by pilgrims who were really religious and went to church all the time? Well, they did, and their great-grandchildren didn't. Uh, they, they, old institutions were still there. These new lives didn't fit them. And it wasn't just membership. For churches that had depended on taxes to sustain themselves and that were accustomed to projecting power through state laws, disestablishment was deeply threatening. So when the legislature in Connecticut formally disestablished the Congregationalist Church in 1818, a young Lyman Beecher thundered, the bondage of corruption commencing here will extend through eternity. The career of iniquity here begun will hold on to its unobstructed course and never end. It felt to Beecher like the end of the world, and in a way, it was. But even as Beecher spoke these words, the voluntary associations that would rise to give new vitality to religion in America were already forming. The American Bible Society was already founded. The Andover model for seminaries was already established. Congregations were already running on the contributions of members. By 1820, it's just that Beecher couldn't see it. By 1827, not even 10 years after he gave that sermon, a whole new constellation had come together. And now Beecher sounded a very different note in a sermon that he gave that year at Plymouth, intentionally commend, uh, commemorating the Puritan founding. The end of the standing order, he said, turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to the state of Connecticut because Quote, it cut the churches loose from dependence on state support. It threw them wholly on their own resources and on God. So Beecher mastered this new world of voluntary associations, moving from the hinterlands of Connecticut to the Hanover Church, the hub of the hub here in Boston. And then in what seemed like a strange move for an upwardly mobile, ambitious clergyman, he moved to cholera-infested Cincinnati to become president of a startup seminary with exactly one faculty member when he got there, Lane Theological Seminary. Making that move only made sense if you believed a school like Lane was essential for the salvation of the world. And that is exactly what Beecher believed. In a plea for the West, 
a fundraising speech that Beecher started uh, to tour up and down the East Coast. I think he gave it multiple times in Boston. Started in 1834, published it in 1835. Beecher makes a case not only for the significance of what was then the West, but also for the significance of the seminary in a world of voluntary associations. And I want to pay a little attention to this uh, address because I think it lays bare the, the kind of founding logic uh, of the seminary form that we've inherited. In Beecher's reasoning, the Mississippi watershed, the West, was the key for white Protestants to win the continent for Christ from the indigenous and Catholic people that they were bumping into as they moved into the interior. And winning this great continent, Beecher said, was the key to winning the world for Christ. And the key to winning the West was voluntary associations. All the little churches, schools, libraries, lyceums, missionary societies, they served, he said, as a kind of trellis on which the white settler project could grow. That white list, that settler, that's my language, not his, but that's what he was saying. <laughs> Voluntary associations facilitated expansion, Beecher said. They helped settlers take root. They also proved, they provided moral legitimation for the project because they proved the superior, superiority of white Protestant Christianity, for they were democratic and participatory, not tyrannical as Beecher imagined Catholic and indigenous communities to be. And the seminary, the seminary, Beecher said, was the key to the whole project because the seminary trained not just ministers but the leaders of all the voluntary societies. So in Beecher's view, the seminary provides the leadership for voluntary associations and voluntary associations provide the institutional lattice that lets white Protestant settler project win the continent and sow the world for Christ. Beecher's articulation of the role of the seminary in salvation history was persuasive. He raised a lot of money for Lane with that sermon. Later readers, like us, might be a little wary or even repulsed by Beecher's train of thought. But I would argue that the structure of his logic, if not the details, still provides the sense of mission and purpose for most theological, accredited theological schools in the US today. Consider a more modest and secularized translation of Beecher's logic. We train the people who lead the movements and institutions that make the world a better place. The structure of Beecher's logic is still there in most of our mission statements. Theological education has instrumental value. It's a means to some other end, like making the world a better place or winning the world for Christ or whatever, but it's a means to an end. And it reaches that end through the mediation of leaders and the institutions they lead. Through these institutions, it makes the world a better place. You know this logic. We live this logic. I think it is important to see that voluntary associations took on meaning through their alignment with a sacred national mission. This is one reason why it was so important for congregations, uh, especially those best adjusted to the world of voluntary associations like mainline uh, Protestants, to have American flags in their sanctuaries. It signaled this connection. And I think the loss of confidence in that sense of a sacred national mission, crystallized in but not limited to moments like the War of Vietnam and the murder of George Floyd, this is one reason the voluntary associations are struggling today. It's hard for them to know what their meaning is if they're not part of a sacred national mission. Seeing this founding connection between voluntary associations and a sacred national mission, I think reminds us of a proper ambivalence about their passing. The voluntary associations celebrated in books like Habits of the Heart and Bowling Alone, they did some astonishing good. I speak as a native son of this world. This is, these are the people who raised me. I know firsthand the power of these associations to do gospel work of justice and mercy, form people for democracy, give meaning to lives, and provide the connective tissue for a whole society. But they could do this work because they were the institutions, because they were charged with meaning through their connection to a post-millennialist project in which white Protestantism won the world. It might have been otherwise. It's not a logical requirement. It's not necessary that it be like this. It might have been otherwise, but it was not. This is the way it was. And so the passing of these voluntary associations should not be only lamented as loss. 
Unraveling, second big point, or why the constellation of voluntary associations is eroding. I want to be a little brief here so that I can get to the more constructive part of the argument. You can read more in the book, or we can talk about it in the Q&A. But the, the rise of the nuns, so-called, and the struggles of congregations, denominations, and seminaries are sometimes seen as signs of secularization. But I think the better diagnosis stresses not secularization, at least not secularization as a kind of simple decline in religious belief and practice, and instead points to individualization, not secularization, but individualization. Two data points here really clinch this argument in my mind. The first is voluntary associations of every kind are struggling. It's not just the religious ones. It's all of them. The institutional form itself is struggling. It's labor unions, political parties. It's the Elks, Kiwanis, Masons. It's the Rotary and the Junior League. It's the Boy Scouts. And yes, Robert Putnam, it's bowling leagues. Voluntary associations of all kinds are experiencing losses in members' money and purpose. So that's one data point to keep in mind. It's not about religion for the, some of these. A second data point, there are multiple signs that interest in all kinds of things that might loosely be described as religion remain strong. The majority of nuns say they believe in God and pray regularly. Tarot card sales last year set a new record in the history of the world. On and on. It, I mean, we could pile up these examples. You know them. It's hard for me to believe, for instance, that empiricism has crowded out all other ways of knowing and made them implausible when QAnon is flourishing. Uh, disaffiliation, disaffiliation from voluntary societies is real. And it has many roots. We can talk about that. But disaffiliation is not the end of religion. Because affiliation is not with a voluntary society is not identical to Christian discipleship. It's not identical to religion. Disaffiliation is an expression of discontent with the institutional forms religion now takes. All right, if this hypothesis is correct, then we might expect to see some signs of vitality in forms of religious life that are not bound to voluntary societies. And that is exactly what we are seeing. So I just want to highlight quick, three quick hits of places where you see kind of a vitality uh, and, and especially within kind of traditional confessional churches. The first is mega churches. A mega church is not a voluntary association. Uh, you, you're, some of them don't even have a concept of membership, right? The, the ones that are furthest along in this. We could have a longer conversation about that, but you're not going to go on to the session of the, uh, of the mega church and start directing it, right? That's not their structure. They're not, fundamentally not voluntary associations. The, another place where we're seeing a lot of growth in American religion is in house churches. These two are not voluntary associations. They function more like what, uh, kinship networks, whether that kinship is established by birth or by choice. But the, their logic is the logic of a kinship network. Uh, they don't have a property committee, right? Uh, they're not a voluntary association in that classic form. So too conferences make space for religious uh, expression apart from voluntary associations. In August of this year, World Youth Day drew 1.5 million Catholics to Lisbon. One and a half million Catholics to Lisbon. And this, the, the power of conferences, you know it through the Proctor Conference, which attracts more than 1,000 people every year. It was brought home to me when I was a little conference that I had organized in San Antonio, and I'm flying home after Joyce Meyer hosted the Love Life Women's Conference, and she sold out the plane, uh, and I had two or three seats. All of these are signs of, but see, you don't, you don't become a member of Joyce Meyer's thing. You show up and have an incredible and intense experience, and then you go do whatever you do with it. All of these are signs of religious vitality that are beyond voluntary association structures. So not secularization, but individualization. Learning from the German sociologist Ulrich Beck and more than a little Foucault, I use language of individualization rather than individualism because I think it better describes the phenomena. Communitarian social theorists often denounce individualism like it's an ideology people might choose. But individualism is not just something we might or might not believe in. 
Individualization is a powerful bundle of material, social, economic, and political processes that discipline us into being individuals. This includes things like the shift from defined benefit pension plans to personal retirement accounts. And it includes a shift in funding, more pointedly, for theological education that has a very small role now for voluntary associations. Both congregations and denominations contribute much less as a percentage than, and in absolute terms than they used to in the past. Who does the burden of funding it fall on? the individual student. These individualizing processes are at work. However we feel about them, they are bearing down on all of us. As the social theorist Taylor Swift has noted, <laughs> you're on your own, kid. If material forces are driving individualization, then we might expect people with the least power to resist them to be the most individualized. And that's what the data shows. Lack of affiliation, for instance, is more common among poorer people. As sociologist Ryan Burge explains, the typical nun is someone who does not have a college degree, makes less than $50,000 a year. Many are struggling economically, socially, and spiritually, and are disconnected from society. The pattern holds across racial and ethnic groups. Among black, Latine, and white populations, wealthier and more highly educated people are more likely, not less likely, to be affiliated with the church. Those who identify as nuns are poorer and have less formal education. Among Asian and Asian American populations, affiliation varies more closely with immigration status than with income, with newer immigrants more likely than others to identify as nuns. It's still a status game played in a different key. It's not just that these groups of variously marginalized people aren't going to church. They're also less likely to get married, less likely to connect with other voluntary associations. They're more likely to die what Aunt, from what Anne Case and Angus Deaton have called deaths of despair. So despite caricatures that run through sermons and pop sociology, the nuns are not primarily wealthy white urbanites who are skipping church to sip mimosas at brunch. They are also young black men denied access to steady employment, white women raising children by themselves in a shredded rural America, otherwise documented immigrants for whom affiliation with an organization would be risky, queer youth who have fled families for their safety, and overworked and overwhelmed people who can't imagine what it would be like to have time to go to church and serve on a committee and worried that they would be looked down on if they tried. So even in a time of unraveling, Lack of affiliation is tangled up with other marginalities in tight knots of mutual reinforcement. So understanding the material forces in individualization makes a difference for how we understand the unraveling of voluntary associations. I think it should lead us to greater compassion for students who come to us seemingly adrift and alone without clear institutional affiliations and the scripts those affiliations provide. And it should also change our prescriptions if individualism is a kind of moral failing, the narcissism that Christopher Lash describes, or the me decade that Tom Wolfe mocks, then we might perhaps try to get people back to church, back to associations with exhortation. But if individualization is a process that happens to us, whether we like it or not, then we can't get out of it even if we get people to change their minds. We're not gonna scold people back into church. So what can we do in this time between the times? All right, third and last big block. Affordances, or what we can take hold of. In ordinary times, uh, and Brian, I, all of this I wrote with you in mind, thinking about uh, practical reasoning. In ordinary, and so uh, forgive me if it's too brief. Practical reasoning involves uh, taking actions towards some end. But in a time when ex the, an existing order has unraveled and a new order is not yet established, the end we seek is not apparent. And so we need what I think of as an eschatological practical reasoning, a practical reasoning that does not seek an end in this world, but is driven by the inbreaking of God's redeeming power in every moment, a practical reasoning that we can use at the end of a world. So what does practical reasoning look like at the end of a world? I think it relies on what I'll call affordances. I'm here building on work by, in the phenomenological tradition from uh, Merleau-Ponty and Hubert Dreyfus and others, but I'm redefining the concept theologically. I wanna think of affordances as the features of the world that, as they are illumined by the inbreaking of God's redeeming love. 
That isn't to say that affordances are the work of God. We've got to be more ambivalent about them than that. But they are features of a world illumined by God. So in speaking of affordances, I mean to describe historically contingent contours of institutions, beliefs, and practices. I think of them like the cracks and crags on a cliff face. Like those crags, affordances have specific forms, but their forms don't dictate how we use them. Seeing a small knob of rock, for instance, we might grab hold of it with a hand, push off of it with a foot, swing over it, or use it to navigate, or even find ways to move past it as if it were not there. So the affordances that I want to name, they have a determinate shape, but they do not determine what we make of them. It's an important piece here. Sociology is not prescriptive, not even theologically informed sociology. It just gives you the lay of the land. Affordances arise in time. They are subject to social forces, worked and reworked by human hands and weathered by contingencies of every kind. They can be relatively benign, readily available for all kinds of useful moves. They can also be scarred by sin. Affordances formed in violence can be treacherous, but they can also, and even at the same time, offer handholds for faithful response. Even structures of domination have seams and self-contradictions that offer affordances for those with eyes to see. We take hold of affordances, trusting that God is creative and persistent, always finding ways to offer love to us, always opening anew the possibility of faithful response. But such faith does not suggest that affordances are simple and straightforward provisions of providence, divinely given resources that are purpose-built for faithful use. Such a vision does too much to flatter the powers of this world. Not everything that offers some affordance is automatically aligned with God's hopes for the world. Uh, such a vision misses the deep ambivalence of what affordances make available to us. They come from mixed sources. They can be used for good or evil or nothing much at all. They can cut our hands even as we make grateful use of them. We can use them and fail. So the affordances that I'm wanting to describe here, they're less like pennies from heaven and they're more like a crazy king who would kill to find someone who can interpret his dreams. In his violent madness, the king creates a handhold by which the people can be saved and God's faithfulness can be displayed. You know the story. That's, the, that's what I mean by an affordance in all of its ambivalence. This does not mean that God appoints the king. It does not mean that God makes the king crazy. It does not mean that God underwrites the power of the king. It just means you've got a crazy pharaoh. Affordances might also be found in, his, in a historically white seminary that starts to recruit students from minoritized groups in earnest when the number of white students who want to enroll is not enough to support the vocations of a mostly white faculty. We don't have to call this an unmitigated good to say that there might be some handholds here for something faithful and innovative. Just so, a seemingly secular age might hollow out spaces of yearning in individuals in which new forms of theological education can take root. But this does not mean that we should accept those yearnings uncritically or conform to the self-understandings of our age. It means that when we try to respond in our time, for we can't turn the clock back or forwards to respond in any other time, it means that we will have things to work with. So I wanna focus these last minutes on three affordances for theological education in an age of individualization. First, what I'll call the felt urgency of authenticity. Individualized individuals find themselves in need of ways to make meaning in their lives. Authenticity is a word that describes what it means to do that work in ways that express some inner self that's taken to be more real than any other. Authenticity has become a magic word, a word to conjure with. It's the main thing people say they want in their religious leaders, and it's a cardinal virtue that many of us seek to embody in our own lives. Now, I don't wanna accept this notion uncritically. As those of you who know me know, it wouldn't be a lecture by me if there wasn't a quote from Adorno, so here it comes. Uh, but as Adorno writes, authenticity is nothing other than a defiant and obstinate insistence on the monadological form which social oppression imposes on man. I think he's right about that. Authenticity is just the ideological penumbra that surrounds individualization. It's the kind of ideological compensation for what's happened to us through the neoliberal mechanisms that have individualized us. So seeing that, 
should give us some real critical awareness about the offerings of authenticity. But it should also make us more aware of the need people for, feel for authenticity. It's what drives a large number of students in theological education now. They're not here to get the professional credential. They are here. Maybe you're here. Maybe you're here to put together a meaningful life here in projects of authenticity. These students uh, hack uh, the, what a curriculum. It's, it's a hacking job. You hack a curriculum that's designed to form you for professional leadership or academic scholarship in order to make meaning for your lives. And an even larger number of people outside the theological academy are eager for this kind of study, study that would help them put a life together. They just don't want to have to get a professional degree to do it. And we see signs of that eagerness in the interest in TED Talks, life hacks, self-help. I mean, the internet is full of people who will help you make meaning from your life, not necessarily great meaning. It's also there in the Alpha course, which some of you may know. Uh, it sp uh, started at, uh, in London and then swept charismatic and the charismatic and evangelical world. It's also there in Candler's new Foundry project, which is trying to bring theological education to people, not just like giving you a, a video of this lecture or something like that, hey, we're going to make it accessible, but a real shift in orientation to where what the education is all about is about facilitating those projects of authenticity and then making it available to everybody, either free or at truly minimal cost. But to say that it's like that doesn't mean it's not intense. It might be multiple classes. It might be really demanding. But as you see from things like CrossFit or SoulCycle or whatever, people are ready to do demanding things to make the kind of selves they want to be. People are not, contrary to communitarian critics, afraid of discipline. They're not afraid of working really intensely. What they don't want to do is be disciplined by an institution that they don't care about or that they don't think cares about them. So what would it mean for theological schools to consciously and intentionally offer opportunities for people engaged in this kind of self-making? It would certainly be available to and interesting to more people. So projects of authenticity are not just for clergy. A key thing here would be to say, hey, if we're going to reorient the curriculum around these projects of authenticity, or at least to make room for them to breathe, that would be for people who want to be clergy. They need that. But we might also need to open up parts of theological education that aren't just for clergy, but are genuinely for everybody. Candler's Foundry Project has already reached 200,000 people in the first four years. Uh, the need for this is just huge. People want it. You know, it might also mean, I think, a new telos for, for uh, theological education. The old complaint of theological faculty was that students always asked, yeah, but will it preach? You'd give some great lecture on Luther, right? And then they'd come up, yeah, but will it preach? What they mean by that is, this, under the old paradigm, how can I use that in leading the voluntary association that I'm a leader of? How can I realize the instrumental goods of that knowledge? In an age of authenticity, that's not the question. Now the question is, what does this mean for me? What does this mean for my life? What's this mean for my people? What would it be like for us to orient our teaching so that those kinds of questions are primary? All right, a second affordance, the deprofessionalization of ministry. This might not sound like an affordance to you. As part of the process of consolidation, the norm for ministry became professional. And here I mean professional in a narrow and somewhat technical sense, describing highly educated workers who are neither labor nor capital, whose capital is in their own knowledge, in their bodies, who are granted a high degree of autonomy and relative wealth in exchange for a promise to act in the best interests of their clients and pursue the common good. Classic definition of professional, right? The majority of preachers in America have never been professional in this sense. But the professional ideal still had power to set norms, as with ATS accreditation. Now, that's what ATS was founded to do, to make ministers professionals, uh, just like the AMA was founded to do that for physicians. Now, though, that power is waning. The whole space of professionals is unraveling. Physicians, attorneys, accountants, teachers, and more all find themselves turned from autonomous professionals into skilled employees. 
uh, for at this point now, the, uh, physicians uh, under 50, the majority of them are employees. They don't own their own practice. That's, a, that's just a sea change in the field of medicine. So in naming this as an affordance, I need to underscore two things. First, I'm not simply celebrating this development. Remember, the crazy, affordances are like crazy pharaohs, right? I'm not rooting for this. It means a loss of income, a loss of stability. It means suffering that is real for me and for people that I care about. So I'm not celebrating that. It's, the loss is also gendered and raced in ways that are profoundly unfair. We have seen again, this happened with librarians, it happened with social workers, it happened with teachers. When women are fully granted entry into a profession, suddenly it deprofessionalizes, right? Suddenly it loses the, the power to put up barriers to entry, wages drop. So this is just one more recursion of that pattern uh, as, as all of these roles are more open to women and people from minoritized com communities than ever before. So this is not something simply to celebrate. I'm also emphatically not saying that church leaders who aren't professional in this narrow sense aren't as smart, faithful, and effective. On the contrary, if you know some of these non-professional ministers, you know the depth of the sacrifices that they make and the incredible power of that kind of witness. So all I'm trying to do here is describe the economic and social realities. This is a general phenomena, but specific to ministry, we might highlight three places where we're seeing deprofessionalization. To me, it's really interesting. Every place that it looks like you're seeing more of this kind of Christianity, you're seeing a deprofessionalized ministry. So here's three examples. First, new immigrant communities. Where is the church growing? It's growing here. These congregations are often led by bi bivocational pastors or ministry teams, often without an MDiv, in traditions for whom professional education has not been a norm. Now, the assumption in many ATS schools is that given time, they will assimilate to a professional pattern and eventually enter MDiv programs. I'm not so sure that that is either uh, going to happen or that I hope it will happen. Um, it assumes, I mean, the, the, the arrogance of that, to assume that everybody would want to be like us if only they could, is just startling, right? So I'm not going to, uh, this, this is a phenomenon that we don't know how it's going to go, and it's not going to be for me to decide. All right, a second place where I see deprofessionalization in a growing corner of the church is a growing number of clergy who are not granted full professional status by which I mean that like a title, participation in the denomination's benefits plan, full voting rights. They're not granted this even by their own denominations. And this is the part of the mainline tradition that is growing. Um, it goes by different names. For Methodists, it's local pastors. For Presbyterians, it's commissioned lay pastors. For Catholic, it's lay ecclesial ministers. These are usually serving smaller congregations, and that's exactly the part of those traditions that are increasing in number. So those jobs are out there, and people are rising to fill them. And formal accredited theological education does very little to support them, right? So that deprofessionalization of ministry is happening there, too. Another place that it might surprise you to see that it's happening is in very large congregations. These congregations are often led by a charismatic founder who is credentialed through paths beyond professional education. And is more, uh, so, you know, T.D. Jakes founds the Potter's House and then gets the MDiv, right? It was already, it's not like the credential enabled him to begin the work. And then they function more like a CEO than an old style professional, which is one reason they have a hard time surviving to a second generation. And even when large congregations are led by a pastor with professional standing and ethos, as many tall steeple mainline congregations are, they tend to, they increasingly fill in all the other ministry roles with paraprofessional ministers who often have other kinds of education, not an MDiv, maybe a one-year MA in youth ministry or whatever. They have different, those folks tend to have different standing in relation to the denomination. They're not in the pension plan usually. They have different job security. They can usually be fired pretty easily if the CEO pastor doesn't want them around anymore. And they function more like skilled employees than classic professionals. So in all these places that the church is growing, ministry is becoming less professional. How is this an affordance? I want to name two ways. The first is educational. One of the deep problems, I think, with professionalizing theological education is the way in which it instrumentalizes theological knowing. 
It makes theological knowing not a good in itself, but it's always a means to some other end. And even when that end is a good end, like making the world more just, when, we, when theological uh, knowledge is turned to that end, it's like enlisting God in our projects. There's all kinds of problems with that. It's also just exhausting, and it, it, you lose the, the value of contemplation. You lose the value of purposeless activity. Worship becomes bent into like a pep rally for you know, uh, effective action in the world instead of being uh, to the glory of God. So it could be a great thing to my mind, if we can turn education away from the instrumentalization that's imposed on it by a professional uh, education model. A second uh, affordance is maybe harder to see. I think there are opportunity here for new kinds of solidarity. One of the problems with professionalization of ministry has been the alienation of the church that has professionalized clergy from poor and working class people and movements, maybe engaging as op uh, objects of charity but not as members, not as us. And this has happened on a broad scale among liberals and leftists in the US. As unions, especially as unions weakened, another project of individualization, the Democratic Party and even leftist movements became more aligned with professional managerial class values. And so the assimilation of ministers and church professionals to the professional managerial class happened through, ha happens through schools like ours, right? But now deprofessionalization is shifting the material standing of ministers. And that, I think, is opening new possibilities for real solidarity. Here's one place I saw it on the ground. It's when you see teachers' unions striking to support hotel workers. It's teachers, when teachers do that, they're saying, you know what, we're not gonna cast our lot with a professional class. We're employees too, and we're gonna work with you for justice. That, and and the, the truth is, they are in a similar economic position. And the truth is increasingly that so are clergy. So what would it be if clergy started telling the truth about our actual social and economic position in the world, we might find new kinds of solidarity. Again, not something to root for, but given that it's real, this might be a faithful way forward. Third, uh, I, a final affordance that I wanna lift up. There are more, but this, this is the last one I wanna lift up tonight. It's especially important to say this here at BU, where Shelley Rambo and others have done so much to help us think about chaplaincy. Chaplaincy is a real affordance for these times. It fits the emerging age so closely. Think about what it is. It's spiritual care without a voluntary association. That's, that's the way to think about what it is. So credentialing requirements, curiously, they're in some tension. Uh, the credentialing requirements for chaplains are in some tension with the deprofessionalization that I named before. If anything, we see more requirements for professional education for chaplains. Theological schools don't do all of that now, but we could do a lot more. We could bring a lot more of that process in, uh, into ourselves. And we could do it, I think, better and differently. But I don't think chaplains are really an exception to the observation about deprofessionalization. Because chaplains typically lack the autonomy of classic professionals. They are rather employees of organizations with missions that they pay chaplains to support. They don't, this is a really different relationship to the mission of the institution than, pref, than professionals in the old sense enjoyed. So chaplaincy, another thing that I think we can take hold of, we, it's an affordance for this time between the times. But in the end, theological education will not continue because we take hold of all these affordances in just the right way. Theological education will continue because God longs to be known. And God longs to be known because God is love. And knowing and being known are partially constitutive of what it means to love. The best theological education in every age has found ways to share in that great work of love. And I think that's the center of the call to us now. Thank you. Curriculum review, anybody? <laughs> oh, uh, 
at this time, let's bring our panelists uh, up to the microphones, if you'd come on up. I'll introduce them in the order in which they'll respond briefly to this lecture, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Reagan Hardiman, right here on my left, is the, uh, a third-year PhD student in practical theology, currently in the exam stage. Pray for Reagan. Uh, <laughs> His work explores the implicit theologies and practices of those who are variously labeled as nuns, the religiously unaffiliated, the spiritual but not religious, or agnostics, among other labels, though Reagan's work troubles and interrogates those definitions in more expansive directions. Uh, he's also a Rangers fan, and after last night, he really probably hasn't had any sleep uh, at all. Uh, we won't dwell on that. Dr. Nicolette Manglos Weber is Associate Professor of Religion and Society, the Director of our Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at the School of Theology. Dr. Manglos Weber is an interdisciplinary sociologist who studies religious community life, focusing on how religion shapes politics and collective well being. She has done research among faith communities in several countries of Anglophone Africa, among migrants to the US and among U.S. young adults facing stress and adversity. She works across scholarly fields in religion, political sociology, global migration, cultural sociology, and social ethics. Dr. David Anderson Hooker is a visiting associate professor of religion and conflict transformation that we're blessed to have with us this year. Dr. Anderson Hooker is a lawyer and former community psychologist with more than 35 years experience as a mediator, trainer, and community builder. He currently serves as the founder and principal narrator for Counter Stories Consulting in Atlanta, Georgia. He previously served as professor of practice for conflict transformation and peace building at the Joan P. Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame. He's also served as senior fellow for community engagement strategies at the University of Georgia's Fanning Institute for Leadership Development. Thank you very much, all three of you. Reagan, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, you little... uh, thank you, yes, very much, everybody, for, for being here. Thank you for the little lecture for having me. I'm afraid I might be a little boring, because Dr. Smith, I think I'm ready to sign the papers, pay my dues, do whatever you're, you're ready to do. Let's, let's get it going. I, I am on board. And I suspect I'm here to, to speak to the um, perspective and experience of students. So let me, let me try that. Uh, as a young and hip, very hip person, <laughs> I, I tend to find myself speaking with many other young and very hip people. And when they ask me what I'm doing, uh, I tell them I am in a PhD program studying theology. And this elicits very many responses, as so many people in here, I'm sure, can attest. What is that? Okay, I can work with that. What do you want to do? So you want to preach? Well, no, I don't think so. And I know this is, this is a shared experience, and I think it's telling of something about the future of theological education. What is our place? What is the role of theology, and what is the public-facing nature of it? And that's not really an initial thought or question, uh, or rather, it is just an initial thought, not a question, but perhaps something we can, a question we can form uh, together tonight. But I do want to wonder more together, both with you, Dr. Smith, hear your thoughts, and from everybody else in the room, the wealth of knowledge that's here, about the role of the increasingly, maybe we call it fragile nature of belief, you know, the, the polarization of what it means to believe, art, are, are everybody who come into a classroom of theological education sharing what might have been considered at some time fundamental beliefs of what it means to do theological education? I think we've established not everybody's a Christian in the rooms. So what does that do? Uh, again, curriculum review, anybody? What is, what is this going to mean for the future? And what is it uh, in relation to this idea of the, the constellation of unraveling? And what is the future forward? Is it a flooding of values and beliefs in classrooms? Or perhaps maybe it's an emptying. Uh, but of course, dichotomies are never really fair. Uh, surely it's something in the middle. And to move into the affordances that you describe uh, as 
illumined by God, works illumined by God, some of which will work, some of them surely won't. Um, they're never really truly and totally prescriptive for everybody. But I kept finding myself thinking of a quote that I encountered in a course on the work of Toni Morrison and a religious reading of it, where she described literature as, as sensitive as a tuning fork, an unblinking witness to the light and shade of the world we live in. And I want to think together about the nature of theological education as both participating in this witness and moving and working in, in between the light and shade of the world that we live in. Again, it's a, a very early question, but hopefully one perhaps we can, we can tease out together. Thank you. Hello, good evening everybody. Um, I have to start with a confession. I have to get this off my chest. About 10 years ago, I was teaching intro to sociology to a room of 200 undergraduates at a state university in Kansas. I had no theological training. I'd never pursued a theology degree. I did not think of myself as a theologian. And here I am 10 years later speaking to the future of theological <laughs> education. And I say that sort of tongue in cheek because I, you know, in the interim period, I was brought to a school of theology which had uh, an enormous, enormously rich history in interdisciplinary studies of uh, religious community life. And I came here and I came to believe in the best moments of theological education and in, and in what it is here. But I also think I come to it with less of a professional commitment to things continuing in the way they are and, and have been. Um, I greatly applaud, uh, Dr. Smith, your use of um, individualization. I, I think there's nothing that drives me crazier when social theorists and others you know, talk about the individualism, the me generation, the, like, you know, people being, um, uh, flippantly discarding their associations, I see in our students a longing for community. I see a longing for connection. The individualists are out there. They are not our students, right? And that's and I, you know, one of the paradoxes of individualism is that we're constantly decrying our individualist society, even while we ourselves long for deeper community and connection. Right? What stands in the way? What stands in the way? Practically speaking, it's structural, right? It's um, too little time to socialize over dinner. It's too much work. <laughs> it's too many papers and too many credit hours and the job that has to be had in order to live in an expensive city like Boston. It's that that makes us individualists, right? Um, so that's just an amen and yes <laughs> to that point. And I see it, you know, every, every single day. Um, and there are so many different, you know, my head was sort of spinning with different threads and ideas as you were speaking, but I think the thing that I, that I want to um, zero in on, because it helped, your language helped crystallize this for me, um, as someone who for many years has been doing periodic research on uh, Christian and Muslim communities in Anglophone Sub-Saharan Africa, um, I have noticed another kind of affordance that um, we could potentially, and I love the language there, I think it's very helpful, that we could potentially use, but also misuse in some pretty significant ways. Um, I was just reading the, in the New York Times last week, uh, they had this big feature that said, in 2050, one in four people in the world will be African, right? I mean, just think about that. Think about how that is transforming not just the world demographics, but the demographics of uh, higher education more broadly and particularly theological education. These are the groups, I mean, we know these are the groups, these are the students that are growing in number faster than any other here at BU, right? I can speak to our experience. Um, and I think the temptation here 
is to say, oh, phew, good news. <laughs> we can do the same stuff we've always been doing. We'll just shift our constituencies, <laughs> right? We'll just draw from this different population um, because con congregational life is flourishing, not just in Africa, many parts, many regions of the world, congregational life is, is, um, is flourishing. And we can assume that they they think of religion, or to use the language of social imaginary, they have the same social imaginary with regard to religious life that we used to, right? The model of the voluntary association. And I'm gonna say I think that social imaginary is misleading when applied to religious communities and congregations around the world. I think it will mislead more than enlighten us, right? Um, Knowing that, you know, like you said, social imaginaries and typologies can, you know, they're always going to fail in certain ways and they're always going to um, obscure things even as they enlighten others. The many, um, you know, the, the work that I've been doing specifically in Uganda, I've developed a sense of a certain maybe version of a social imaginary that, um, that is brought to congregational life that is very different from the voluntary association. And that is um, a center of collective and connective power for survival, right? And I could go into, you know, the kind of the histories of why such a, an approach is necessary, how such a social imaginary with relation to religious community life developed, but I don't, you know, have time for all that. But I will say that in Uganda, where I've been studying community-based organizations, I have, and, you know, how they build off the congregational, the church and mosque infrastructure, and also extend beyond it. I have seen these as spaces where people come to gather together to survive, right? Share resources, keep each other alive under the absolutely tragic and damaging effects of global capitalism and its exploitations, right? And I wanna say that there's very different social imaginaries that people around the world bring to religious community and religious community life, but because some of the trappings and the categories and the artifacts are similar, they sort of find themselves here getting an MDiv, a North, you know, at a big fancy North American seminar, seminary. And if we don't actually take the time to explore the question of what the social imaginary is through which they approach theological education, we are going to, we will cut ourselves on that affordance. I really think so. So that's where I'll end. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. I prepared my responses by reading your chapter. The challenge with that is, in your talk, is it not, did mm -hmm. I not push it in a way that makes it on? Mm. No, it seems on. like it's, yeah, on. it's on. Okay, perfect. <laughs> I, I prepared for the talk by reading this chapter five on affordances, right? And beautiful chapter except I have no idea what affordances are when I read the chapter. <laughs> when I hear you talking about them, they are very clear and they are distinctly different from what I was imagining them to be. Right? So one of the things that I think is really important, even as we talk about imagining social imaginaries, reimagining what the social imaginary will be, and, and understanding these affordances, is to go one level deeper than that. So there's, if you do what would be called like a causal layered analysis, there's a litany of problems, and we see the structures from which that litany emerges. We begin, and I think the social imaginary begins to imagine the worldview or the discourse that makes space for those structures. And then there are the underlying myths and metaphors that make 
even those discourses make sense, right? My sense is that some of the myths and metaphors from which the social imaginary, the structure, the litany arise have to be completely deconstructed as well. So we can't stop by just looking at and reimagining um, the structures themselves as a way, because structures conform to a narrative sense. And the narratives which emerge out of those myths and metaphors still have an embedded sense of hierarchy and superiority and chosenness and exclusion and not necessarily pointing towards solidarity, mm -hmm. which is what we would hope that by connecting with these different communities, by connecting with the changing demographics, you point towards a solidarity. And so I'm not sure if we can stop just as the social imaginaries, there may be some value in looking at some of those underlying myths and metaphors, right? So that's a, that's a first thought. I, when I invite my classes to prepare their readings, I always invite them to do, to identify four things. We call them quips. So questions, uh, insights, interesting points, problems. That's, and I just wanna identify a couple of insights or really interesting points uh, that I thought were valuable in the uh, chapter that you didn't highlight here, but you kind of, you alluded to them. One was this notion that individualization has unraveled, you described them as ascribed identities, yeah. and created pressure for achieved identities, uh, making authenticity a central value of that. And I think that's a, that's a place to go back and have more conversation about. Um, the other thing I'm just going to say is just because in the chapter, when you all get the book, you should get this book, but in the chapter, there is a beautiful sentence. I just, I'm just going to read it just to put it into the space for GBH, if nobody else. <laughs> What would it be like to orient theological education around the need to give deeply truthful and richly theological accounts of ourselves? What if, instead of preparing students for professional leadership in network and voluntary associations, which is what you phrased, theological education acknowledged our shared need to form identities and connections in the wake of this distant, this individualization. So I just want to put that out because I think it's just beautiful mm -hmm. writing. Tell me please what is a mortified and redeemed authenticity? If you haven't read the chapter, you don't have any idea what I'm talking about. This is a conversation. But there's something that you say like this mortified and redeemed authenticity is a place that provides the illumination so that we understand what the affordances are. I just want to invite you to, if you, if you will, just to say another word about that. And then the final thing that I will talk about is the beauty of the possibilities of difference, uh, of different ways of being a theological education space. The house of refuge, the marker space, the monastery, uh, kind of a new order monastery, a center for higher times, all of that, you know, I think those structures will emerge from a different set of myths and metaphors, both about um, theological education, but also a different understanding about God and how it is that we might at some point be in relationship with God as a way of being in relationship with one another. And so I just wanted to highlight and appreciate that. I'll stop there. There's a lot more in the chapter that I'd love to engage with, but that's all good for me. Thank you all. And uh, Dean Smith, maybe we'll ask you first to come and maybe take stock of those responses and see if you have anything you'd like to say to that. And then we'll open it up for questions from, uh, and comments from the rest of us. And we'll put a, one of the microphones over there. And if you have a question, please just come to that stand right there and we'll get you in the queue. So, thank you. 
Thanks for these thoughtful responses. And what all of them were too gracious to tell you is that I did not provide them with a manuscript before tonight. And so they, they were, uh, it was very kind of you to work from the chapter. I appreciate it. Um, and I, I want to move, I'm going to move too quickly, uh, not because it's not super substantive stuff, but because I do want to make space for the room. Um, Reagan, the notion about the fragile nature of belief and whether especially in religiously plural spaces we'll need a flooding of values and beliefs or an emptying, and you're like, ah, oh, it's a dichotomy. It's probably always going to be somewhere in the middle. I was thinking maybe somewhere in the middle, but maybe it's going to actually be a maxing out of both at once. Um, and to kind of imagine what that sort of space would look like. Um, I think that all of our schools are going to be wrestling with what it, or how we want to engage religious pluralism. And we've seen an, an array of options. To me, part of, part of the good, what, what we can't do is to try to, the, the professional model promised itself as a kind of homogenizing force across religious difference, right? Rabbis, imams, Pastors, they're all really the same kind of thing. They're all religious professional leaders. They can all have the same kind of education. I think it's just to your point, Nicolette, about no, 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 the differences are deeper than you imagined, whether it's uh, the differences between Uganda and the US or between these traditions. So to create the kind of space where you can have full-throated pluralism, all of it there, um, but then to create a space that can hold that. Um, Nicolette, I, I really, uh, so appreciated uh, that you're pressing towards, uh, well, first, you're, uh, you're distinguishing between the, the social imagine, arguing that the voluntary association social imaginary will mislead us in thinking that we understand congregations. I, I, that, you said that so clearly, and it's something I've kind of been groping towards, so I really appreciate your naming it. It also frames for me one of the key questions uh, that I think that I'm just trying to observe in the United States. Um, one of the, one reviewer of the book uh, in, in the Presbyterian Outlook said, yeah, this is true um, for pre white folk and Presbyterians, but it's not true of new immigrant communities. There you see congregational vitality. And, uh, and I thought, yeah, I'd, I'm not sure though that that con you do see congregational vitality. I'm not sure that they're a voluntary association, and I'm not sure that they're going to become one. And but in the past, the power of institutional isomorphism has been so strong that the U.S. has turned these other communities into voluntary associations and denominations. But I'm not sure that it is that powerful now. I'm not sure it's going to be able to do that. So, but again, that I think that's something that. I certainly don't know at this point, but your question helps me know how to watch. And David, I really appreciate the call to go one layer deeper than social imaginaries to myths and metaphors. I think that's right. We need not just, and, and this is something I was at least trying for in editing the series. I think you're right that we need interventions on those deeper levels. I think they often are gonna require different rhetorical modes it's not gonna be able to happen through an essay or like an academic talk, which this was. It's gonna require poetry, ecstatic speech. Uh, it's gonna be visual arts. It's gonna be, I don't, you know, it's gonna be the full range of human expression. So uh, if you've read other books in this series, sometimes they push the boundaries of genres um, and that's on purpose and it's exactly for that. If we're trying to reorient those deepest levels, it's gonna take different kind of speech than I did tonight, no doubt. Um, and I bet you can provide more of it than I can. Um, and then, I, I mean, gosh, I, I'm, you, nothing could be make, make me happier than that you asked me, tell me about a mortified and redeemed authenticity. <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> um, uh, the language I'm borrowing uh, from Walter Benjamin, I talk a lot about this mortification and stuff and the new measures, but basically, uh, here's what I mean in specific to authenticity. I mean, that we don't accept uncritically the notion of authenticity. And, and um, to me, an uncritical acceptance says that there's a pre-social self that is found, not made, and that is then expressed. 
and that that's what authenticity is, is having a public persona that corresponds to your pre-social self, that little me just inside me that no one else can see, right? Um, that is such a powerful notion. So I, use the, I work with Judith Butler in that to break up that notion of authenticity for one in which we are making selves. But then the question is, by what standard do you assess that? If not the, the pre-social given ontological self, how do you assess the authenticity of these productions, right? And I think we assess them in reason giving within community in those kind of shared spaces. That to me would be the more redeemed version. But the, the uncritical version that many of our students bring, and they're like, hey, I'm here on a project of authenticity. So you can't give me a C, right? I'm just being me. I'm expressing myself, right? And you're like, and how can you tell me that I'm not saying what I believe? I'm telling my truth. Um, that's the naive version, or end classes that are structured to produce that, and our own work that, that produces that or claims those kind of privileges. All right, let's, just such a great set of comments, especially on short notice, thank you. Questions from other folks? Microphone is open. Please come up to the microphone. Thank you so much, Dr. Teddy. I uh, really appreciate your lecture for today. Um, first, uh, when I read the title of the lecture for today, my first question is coming to my head is, uh, is theological uh, education is really needed in this postmodern, you know, post-Christianity era? That's kind of like my first question. Um, I'm an I'm a Indonesian. I come from Indonesia. Uh, I've been here for five years. There's a kind of like phenomena that I seeing every day that people in America, they kind of like shy to be religious rather than to be spiritualist. Sort of like that, that I saw. This is kind of like objective yeah, uh, yeah. assessment about Your the observations. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the idea of religious and also spiritualist, this is kind of like try to shape some kind of uh, the new phenomena and phenomena uh, in, in the so society, I think. Uh, that can make a kind of the necessity of religious we do not need anymore, at least based on my uh, idea. Uh, my experiences I watch here that I am seeing here that uh, we do not have the differences between who become religious, who become not religious, sort of like that. That kind of, I think, that make people do not really need again any more uh, theological education, at least for my understanding. Um, I went to the church and I saw and I heard some preacher said, it's okay you are a sinner, it's okay what, whatever you are, right? But in my idea and even in my back culture, uh, we will heard that it doesn't matter you are a sinner, but you have to repent. I am a the, uh, biblical study student, biblical student, uh, we, we have in, in Hebrew Bible the idea about the uh, kadosh, to be different, to be distinguished, right? Uh, I think the idea of to be different and to be distinguished, we do not find it in theological, like, theological education that make us do not really again anymore, by using your term, the idea of authentic, authenticity. Uh, yeah, that, that's kind of like my, 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 my idea. So my question is, uh, we have passed through post-pandemic uh, almost like three years. What, what, what is your prophecy? What, what is your imaginary about the next Christianity in the U.S. after post-pandemic? Do you think theological, theological education will be really needed anymore or probably it's going to be it is same? Because you're saying about the crisis, right? And then the end of your lecture, you said about love. For me, love is not enough. Love has to be different. Become a Christian, especially learning about theological education, uh, we learn about uh, the different love. It's not general love. That makes us origin, original and also authentic rather than others. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I want to say how grateful I am for your observations here as one who's lived in the States for five years and just... Uh, those perspectives, I think, are, are just essential for any kind of three-dimensional understanding of what's going on. So it's great to hear uh, your observations uh, coming back. So uh, 
two, one, one quick response on just, I, I really connect with you around the sense that uh, Christian folk are called to be different in some way. Um, I think that's right. Uh, there needs to be a manifest difference. I think uh, the, qu the thing is, though, um, difference becomes visible in part through similarities. And I don't think we would be cease to be human. I don't think we would cease to be under you know, late stage capitalism. We won't be, because there's no opting out of these worlds, right? And when we think that we opt out of the powers and principalities of this age, when we think that we've transcended them or something, usually that, that's the way they sneak back in and control the situation without our even being able to name it, right? And so we lose a critical awareness. So to me, this is the way I feel about authenticity. We don't really have a choice about needing to do the project of authenticity now. Like that's what's thrust upon all the people who are in this dispensation. I do, so I don't think Christians can abandon that, but I do think Christians need to perform it in some distinctive ways, ways that are made different by um, ways that are transformed by not only a knowing of the revelation of God in Christ, but an encounter with that revelation. So what would that look like? Um, and then to your question about the future, if you, I, am, I have been introduced like 12 times as someone who thinks about the future of theological education. I do not think about the future. I know nothing about the future. I know something about the past, right? And, but I'm, I'm really committed to not predicting the future in part because, so I'm not, I'm not trying to be, you know, just a jerk, uh, but I, I'm committed to not doing that because I think the future is contingent. What's going to happen depends on the decisions that people in this room will make. Those decisions are not preordained and a lot is riding on them. So, it's going to matter what we do. What will the future be? We'll see. I mean, you can kind of predict it like political physics or something, but I don't think that can ever be fully accurate. It just, the future, part of what God does is to hold the future, to, hold, to reopen and reopen the possibility for faithful response, even after we've shut it down uh, with our allegiance to the powers and principalities of the world. So you show me what it's going to be. Thank hey. you for the great talk. So my question is, so for denominational seminaries like this one, um, to what degree do you think the denomination has a responsibility to financially support them? And then on that, to what degree does the denomination get to have an expectation about what the education is? And at a place like BU, where the larger university is basically secular, to what degree does the larger university have both a financial responsibility <laughs> and sort of an ability to dictate? Come up here. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I know of what you speak. Yeah. Um, uh, I think, I think it, it, there's, a, there's a whole section in the book on denominations. Um, I think congregations of some kind are going to, will unquestionably survive. Christians have gotten together in various forms. They're really different. A house, a second century house church is not the same thing as a 12th century Paris uh, uh, parish, right? And that's not the same thing as a congregation in 21st century Lagos. And that's not the same thing as a 21st century congregation here. So, but some kind of gathering is going to survive. Denominations, though, those are optional. Um, it's not clear to me that, or what, what I think has happened with denominations, if you remember, uh, Robert Westnow had an argument in the 90s about special purpose groups within denominations, things that were advocating in one way or the other. And really what's happened is that denominations have become special purpose groups. Uh, now, in that they are less the kind of institution where the institution and its connection to a national mission is central, and they're more spaces of, of expressiveness. And in that, I think denominations may well survive as they've turned into that. Like my own Presbyterian Church USA is smaller now, but everybody's happier and better adjusted to it, and they use it as a, and they use it as a kind of expressive vehicle for all kinds of things. To me, I feel the poverty of that in some ways. Um, but. Uh, but it may be a durable form. The denomination surviving as a large, expressive, special purpose group. Um, so should the denomination fund theological education? I'm not sure they can. Should they make, should they make demands on us? Mm, no. 
They, they need to enter into a learning process with us. Uh, you know, I think denominations need the same, need an even deeper reform, really, than theological schools. It's a great question, yeah. Let's just take two more. I'm sorry, yeah. Go on. Uh, hello. 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 Hi, me? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Dean Smith, for this wonderful talk. I am from Colombia. Uh, I came here to um, to study at this wonderful institution, um, which I'm very grateful. Uh, but I have like many many um, observations regarding to what you talk because I feel like very identified. For example, I'm taking a class on what is the church, not here, but through another, in another school that I have access to the BTI. And everything we talked about, the crisis of the church, and the declining of the church. And I am like, what church are you talking about? Mine's Mine not. is not in decline. Go to East Boston and see how filled those churches are. Or go to any black church. Like, we are, this class should be called, like, the white mainline church, right? So, like, who, who, I, I wonder who are the students that are preparing, and, and especially, like, what are the communities that school att attempts for them to serve, right? And meanwhile, in s certain seminaries where our safe space, we are like dealing with people who are saying, those churches are conservatives and we don't have anything to do with them. I and that's a big obstacle for that solidarity you are talking about. Yes. Right? So it's like all bad in many ways. But my question, my concrete question is, um, how something I, I've seen here in the seminary is like there are some people that come here because we want to um, contribute to the liberation of our communities through theology, right? Like through discipleship, through uh, um, uh, preaching the gospel or practicing the gospel, living out the gospel. Well, there are other students who have like a, a very problematic evangelical past and background, and they want to use theology to liberate themselves from the ecclesial institution. So I find tensions there, like, how can we like be in the same, like, we are in the same space, but it's hard when you try to edify your faith, uh, and other students are like deconstructing the whole thing. So it's hard, right? It's hard to be in the same space, and it's hard that institutions can like, like fulfill both needs. So how do you see that? Uh, if that happens in Canada, for example. I don't know. That's my question. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. All, all of these points are so great. Um, on the parochialism of my talk, that, uh, I mean, you were too nice to say it, but that it was, that it too was about, it was just too focused on this white main line rather than more broadly. Well, to some degree, yeah. I think, but it, I, this was what, no, 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 no. I'm, but this was one of the, uh, there's a whole series of books in this, and part of my vision on that was to intentionally parochialize my own voice, right? And to say, uh, we're gonna have all these, and then I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and speak kind of concretely about the communities that I know best without any pretension that it's the whole story. And if you want other stories, you need to read Elizabeth Condor Fraser on Hispanic Bible Institutes. You gotta read, you gotta read all this other, because this is a huge, diverse thing, and it needs to be told by other people. So you're exactly right, I think, on that. And, it, and we've gotta build that into theological education. Um, pe liberals who won't c uh, consort with people who are, because they're too conservative, this drives me crazy, especially because it breaks up what could be real meaningful solidarities along lines of class and for economic reform. So I will, I will insist on all kinds of differences. Like I will never like pretend to not believe something that I believe, but I will work with anybody <laughs> as far as we can go. And I, I really think we need a lot more of that. And when we have litmus tests uh, for who we'll work, cooperate with, it just becomes a real, it's a real obstacle in American politics right now. And so some students in a classroom are in a constructive mode that's linked to really important political projects. Some students are in a deconstructive mode that is also linked in some ways to their own emancipatory projects. They might be more personalized. How do you put those things together in a classroom? First, I think that's just a drop dead brilliant observation about the dynamic in your classrooms. And then the second thing I'd say about that is, this is a, this is a challenge for us as teachers, as pedagogues, to kind of, and to me, that, soup, that, that energy that you described would be super exciting, 
Because if I had a room of deconstructors, I would push back with the constructive stuff, right? Or if I had a room of people who were constructive, I might say, yeah, but. But if the student, if it, all that energy is already in the room, then the students can do all of that work. And then I would enter into a different kind of facilitator role and supporter. So I, I hope that's what can happen. And I'm excited that you're in those kind of classes. Hello. Hey. Uh, I'm Gabriel Reed from GVH Forum Network. And we have a couple questions online um, from Professor uh, Luis Menendez Antunia. Um, <laughs> Uh, he asks, um, is there room for contracultural affordances? Um, and he asked in the light of Dr. Hooker uh, call to go deep to a deeper layer. Um, and then the second question is, what if the uh, imaginaries that sustain the affordances we see as opportunities are not life-giving? So either of those questions. Can you say the second question yeah, again? Yeah, yeah. Um, what if the uh, imaginaries that sustain the affordances we see as opportunities are not life-giving? Yeah. Uh, these are great questions. Um, first, on, I'll, I'll take the second one first. I think all kinds of affordances are not life-giving. Um, go back to the crazy pharaoh example. An affordance is not an opportunity necessarily. It's just the kind of structure of the world as illumined by grace. And um, so there could be all kinds of responses. Sometimes what we might need to do is to just pound that affordance with a hammer, right? <laughs> or something like that. So again, I want you to hear, I'd want to stress the deep ambivalence of this theological account of affordances, not opportunities in a B-school kind of strategizing way, right? That's not what they are. Um, and then to the question of countercultural affordances, that's a great question. Um, I think I'm at this point in, in history, I am, and this is as a true born and bred Gen Xer who like bet the farm on being alternative, right? Um, but so, but I've, but I've seen it happen. We, um, what happened is that alternative culture became the dominant culture. And the whole idea of being countercultural, be, there is nothing more of our dominant culture right now than presenting oneself as countercultural, right? So I'm really wary of the notion of counterculture, um, especially as a valorizing point. What I would want to, which, what I'd want to say, say instead, like to me, the question is not how different are you from some projected, imagined caricature of the normie. Uh, that's not the question. The question is, how close are you to Jesus? Or how close are you to justice? Or how close are you to the, God's hope for the world? And then the, the best attitude towards culture is a kind of indifference. Like, I'm not really measuring my, what, my project by the proximity to cultural norms. Um, if I'm close, great. If I'm not, great. I don't care. Right, that, but that's what I'd want to, so I, I, I just want to break the attachment to ideals of a counterculture. Thanks very much, uh, Dean Smith. This has been a very rich evening. We're appreciative to you for coming and delivering such a great, thoughtful lecture. Thanks to our panelists, and let's uh, give them warm appreciation. Uh, have a good evening, and thanks for coming.